Fire Alarm by Michael Lowey. This is chapter one, um, but part three of chapter one. So thesis eight. The tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. We must attain to a conception of history that accords with this insight. Then we will clearly see that it is our task to bring about a real state of emergency, and this will improve our position in the struggle against fascism. One reason fascism has a chance is that in the name of progress, its opponents treat it as a historical norm. The current amazement that the things we are experiencing are still possible in the 20th century is not philosophical. This amazement is not the beginning of knowledge unless it is the knowledge that the view of history which gives rise to it is untenable. Benjamin is here contrasting two conceptions of history with clear political implications for the present. On the one hand, the cozy progressive doctrine for which historical progress, the development of societies towards more democracy, freedom or peace is the norm, and on the other, the one for which he himself argues, which takes as its standpoint the tradition of the oppressed, for whom the norm or rule of history is the oppression, barbarism, and violence of the victors. The two conceptions react in diametrically opposing ways to fascism. For the former, it is an exception to the norm of progress, an inexplicable regression, a parenthesis, in the onward march of humanity. For the latter, it is the most recent and brutal expression of the permanent state of emergency that is the history of class oppression. Benjamin was doubtless influenced by the idea of Carl Schmitt in political theology from 1921, a work, which, a work which interested him greatly, particularly for its identification of sovereignty, whether it be monarchical, dictatorial, or republican. With the state of emergency, he is sovereign whose executive power over the state of emergency. We find this theme also in the origin of German tragic drama. After citing Carl Schmidt, Benjamin observes, writing of the Counter-Reformation, that the ruler is designated from the outset as the holder of dictatorial power if war, revolt, or other catastrophes should lead to a state of emergency. He adds a few pages later, the theory of sovereignty which takes as its example the special case in which dictatorial powers are unfolded positively demands the completion of the image of the sovereign as tyrant. These observations from the 1920s were doubtless in Benjamin's mind when in 1940 he was pondering the nature of the Third Reich. Such a view of things makes it possible to situate fascism as a further state in the triumphal procession of the victors, as the head of the Medusa, as the supreme, final face of the recurrent barbarism of the powerful. Its great failing, however, is that it does not bring out the novelty of fascism, particularly in its Hitlerian variant in relation to the old forms of domination. What the Frankfurt School was to call total administration and Hannah Arendt totalitarianism. We must say in Benjamin's defense that the most characteristic manifestations of this historical novelty, the concentration camp system, the death factories, and the industrial extermination of Jews and gypsies would only develop in all their terrifying potency after his death during the years 1941 to 45. One of the trump cards of fascism was, as Benjamin stressed, the incomprehension shown by its opponents, inspired as they were by the ideology of progress. He is thinking of the left here, as is made explicit in one of the preparatory notes for the theses. Two examples will allow us to illustrate what he is referring to. For social democracy, For social democracy, fascism was a vestige of the past. It was anachronistic and pre-modern. In his writings of the 1920s, Karl Kotsky explained that fascism was possible only as, 
in a semi-agrarian country like Italy, but could never prevail in a modern industrialized nation like Germany. For its part, the official Stalinist communist movement was convinced that Hitler's victory of 1933 was ephemeral. It was a matter of a few weeks or a few months before the Nazi regime would be swept away by the workers' movement and progressive forces under the leadership of the KPD, German or German Communist Party. Benjamin had grasped perfectly the modernity of fascism, its intimate relation with contemporary industrial capitalist society. Hence his critique of those, the same people who were astonished that fascism should still be possible in the 20th century, blinded as they were by the illusion that scientific, industrial, and technical progress was incompatible with social and political barbarism. This astonishment is not the Thomasine of Aristotle, the source of all philosophical knowledge. It leads only to a failure to understand fascism, and hence it leads to defeat. What is needed, observes Benjamin in one of the preparatory notes, is a theory of history on the basis of which fascism can be examined. Only a conception without progressivist illusions can account for a phenomenon like fascism that is deeply rooted in modern industrial and technical progress and was ultimately possible only in the 20th century. The understanding that fascism can triumph in the most civilized countries and that progress will not automatically cause it to disappear will enable us, he thinks, to improve our position in the anti-fascist struggle, a struggle whose ultimate aim is to produce the real state of emergency, or more literally, the real state of exception, that is, the abolition of domination, the classless society. This utopian state of exception is prefigured by all the revolts and uprisings that interrupt, if only for a brief moment, the triumphal procession of the powerful. It is also prefigured playfully and even grotesquely in certain popular celebrations, such as Carnival. Benjamin is in accord here with Mikhail Bakhtin, in a story from the 1920s entitled Gesprach über dem Corso, he writes, The carnival is an exceptional state, a descendant of the ancient Saturnalia, when everything was turned upside down and the lords waited on the slaves. But an exceptional state really only stands out against an, an ordinary one. Except, of course, for the fact that the carnivalesque interlude was merely a way of letting off steam, and the masters recovered their places on top once the festival was over. Clearly the aim of the real estate of exception in which there would no longer be any top or bottom, any masters or slaves was quite different. Thesis nine. My wing is ready for our flight, I'm all for turning back, for even staying timeless time, I'd have but little luck. Um, that was a little poem from Gerhard Shalom. Um, from Greetings from the Angelus. There's a picture by Klee called Angelus Novus. It shows an angel who seems about to move away from something he stares at. His eyes are wide, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how the angel of history must look. His face is turned towards the past, where a chain of events appears before us. He sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage, and hurls it at its feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise and has got caught in his wings. It is so strong that the angel can no longer close them. This storm drives him irresistibly into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows towards the sky. What we call progress is this storm. This is Benjamin's best-known text, and it has been quoted, interpreted, and utilized on countless occasions and in the most diverse contexts. Quite clearly, it has seized the imagination of our age, doubtless because it touches upon something profound in the crisis of modern culture, but also because it has a prophetic dimension. Its tragic warning seems to prefigure Auschwitz and Hiroshima, the two greatest catastrophes of human history, the two most monstrous ruins that crown the pile growing towards the sky. This thesis sums up as though in a focal point, 
the whole of the document. It is an allegory in the sense that its elements have no signification outside the role intentionally assigned to them by the author. Benjamin had been fascinated by religious allegories, particularly those of the Trauerspiel, the German classical drama in which allegory is the facies Hippocratica of history that offers itself to the spectator's gaze as a petrified primordial landscape. Thesis 9 is exactly this, word for word. The thesis presents itself as the commentary on a painting by Paul Klee, which Benjamin had acquired in his youth. In reality, what it describes bears very little relation to the painting. What is involved here is, in the main, the projection of his own feelings and ideas onto the German artist's subtle and austere picture. In the construction of this text, Benjamin probably took his inspiration from certain passages, certain poetic images in the Fleur du Mal. For example, these lines from poem L21, a fantastical engraving, seem to describe the vision of humanity's past the Benjaminian angel perceives. A graveyard's empty plain where lie with pallid sunshine overhead from old and modern times the stories dead or the storied dead but the relationship of thesis nine to baudelaire is more profound the meaning structure of allegory is based on a correspondence in the baudelarian sense between the sacred and the profane between theology and politics which runs through each of the images for one of the figures of the allegory, the two meanings are given to us by the text itself. The profane counterpart to the storm blowing from paradise is progress, which is responsible for an unremitting catastrophe and a pile of ruins rising up to the sky. But for the others, we have to find their social and political meaning by reference to other writings of Benjamin's. The storm blowing from paradise doubtless evokes the fall and expulsion from the Garden of Eden, it is in these terms that Adorno and Horkheimer interpreted it in a passage in Dialectic of Enlightenment, which picks up on Benjamin's image and idea, though they do not acknowledge the quotation. The angel with the fiery sword who drove man out of paradise and onto the path of technical progress is the very symbol of that progress. What is the secular equivalent of this lost paradise from which progress is dis distancing us more and more? Several clues suggest to us that, for Benjamin, it is primitive, classless society. In the article on Bakufin, um from 1935, mentioned in the introduction, he writes, with regard to ancient matriarchal communities, of a, of a profoundly democratic and egalitarian communistic society at the dawn of history. And in the essay, Paris, the capital of the 19th century, he comes back to this idea the experiences of the classless society of prehistory laid down in the collective unconscious engender through inter interpenetration with what is new, utopia. At the opposite extreme from paradise lies hell. This is not mentioned in Thesis 9, but several of Benjamin's texts suggest a correspondence between modernity, or progress, and infernal damnation. For example, in this passage from the 1938 text, Central Park, made up of fragments on Baudelaire, which has some obvious affinities with Thesis 9, he writes, The concept of progress must be grounded in the idea of catastrophe. The things are status quo is the catastrophe. Strindberg's idea. Hell is not something that awaits us, but this life here and now. In what sense, for Benjamin and the Arcades Project, the quintessence quintessence of hell is the eternal repetition of the same, the most fearful paradigm of which is to be found not in Christian theology, but in Greek mythology, Sisyphus and Tantalus, condemned to the eternal return of the same punishment. In this context, Benjamin quotes a passage from Engels, comparing the worker's interminable torture, compelled as he is, endlessly to repeat the same mechanical movement with the infernal punishment of Sisyphus. But this is not just something that afflicts the worker. The whole of modern society, dominated by commodities, is subject to repetition, to the emerg always the same, disguised as novelty and fashion, 
in the realm of commodities, humanity figures as damned. The angel of history would like to halt, to bind the wounds of the victims crushed beneath the pile of ruins, but the storm carries it on inexorably towards the repetition of the past, to new catastrophes, new he hecatombs, ever vaster and more destructive. It is striking to contrast the tragic gaze of Benjamin's angel of history with the perfectly Olympian gaze of history as described by Schiller in one of the canonical texts of the progressive Ofklarung, which the author of the theses doubtless knew by heart. Um, was heist und zu welcome Andy Studert man universal gesch Guest <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. Okay, like Homer's Zeus, the history gazes down with equal serenity on the bloody works of war and on peaceful people who innocently obtain their nourishment from the milk of their herds. However, irregularly, man's freedom appears to be governing the course of the world. She calmly observes the confused spectacle. For her far-reaching gaze detects already from afar how this erratically meandering freedom is being steered along the lines of necessity. One cannot but assume that Benjamin chose deliberately to take the opposite stance to this fam famous passage, opposing the despairing attitude of his Marxist Jewish angel to the serene and peaceful gaze of Schiller's Zeus. The ruins at issue here are not, as they were for the romantic painters or poets, an object of aesthetic contemplation, but a poignant image of the catastrophes, massacres, and other bloody works of history. In choosing this term, Benjamin was probably pursuing an implicit confrontation with Hegel's philosophy of history, that immense rationalistic theodicy which legitimated every ruin and every historical infamy as a necessary stage in the triumphal march of reason, as an unavoidable moment of humanity's progress toward the consciousness of freedom. Weltgeist is Weltgericht. <laughs> world history is the world's court of judgment. According to Hegel, history looks at first sight like an immense field of ruins, on which the untold miseries of individual human beings resound, an altar on which the happiness of nations and the virtue of individuals are slaughtered. Given this most terrifying picture, the, this distant spectacle of confusion and wreckage, one might tend towards an extreme pitch of hopeless sorrow with no redeeming circumstances to counterbalance it, a deep-seated sense of revolt and moral affliction. Yet we must go beyond these first negative results and lift ourselves above these sentimental reflections to grasp the essential point, namely that these ruins are merely means in the service of the substantial destiny, the true result of world history, the realization of universal spirit. Benjamin's approach consists precisely in standing this view of history on its head, in demystifying progress and riveting a gaze imbued with a deep inconsolable sadness, but also with a profound moral revulsion on the ruins it produces. These no longer bear witness, as in Hegel, to the transience of empires. Hegel mentions the empires of Carthage, Palmyra, Persepolis, and Rome, but are rather an allusion to history's great massacres, hence the reference to the dead and to the cities destroyed by war from Jerusalem, destroyed by the Romans, to the ruins of Guernica and Madrid, the towns and cities of Republican Spain bombed by the Luftwaffe in 1936-37. Why refer to progress as a storm? The term also appears in Hegel, who describes the tumult of world events as a storm blowing over the present. But in Benjamin, the word is probably borrowed from biblical language, where it evokes catastrophe and destruction. It was by a storm that humanity was downed in the flood and by a firestorm that Sodom and Gomorrah were swept away. The comparison between the flood and Nazism is moreover suggested by Benjamin in a letter of January 1937 to Shalom, in which he compares his book Dutch Menschen 
to an ark built after the Jewish fashion in the face of the rising fascist flood. But this term also evokes the fact that, for conformist ideology, progress is a natural phenomenon governed by the laws of nature, and as such, inevitable and irresistible. In one of the preparatory notes for the theses, Benjamin explicitly criticizes this positivistic, naturalistic approach of historical evolutionism. The project of discovering laws for the course of historical events is not the only means, and hardly the most subtle, of assimilating historiography to natural science. How is this storm to be halted? How is progress to be interrupted in its unstoppable forward march? As ever, Benjamin's answer is twofold, religious and secular. In the theological sphere, this is a task for the Messiah. Its secular equivalent or correspondent is none other than revolution. The messianic revolutionary interruption of progress is then Benjamin's response to the threats to the human race posed by the continuance of the evil storm, the imminence of new catastrophes. We are, in 1940, a few months away from the beginning of the final solution, a non-religious image. In Benjamin's preparatory notes, sums up this idea, and in doing so, runs counter to the commonplace assumptions of the progressive left. Marx says that revolutions are the locomotive of world history, but perhaps it is quite otherwise. Perhaps revolutions are an attempt by the passengers on the train, namely the human race, to activate the emergency brake. The image suggests implicitly that if humanity were to allow the train to follow its course, already mapped out by the steel structure of the rails, and if nothing halted its headlong dash, we would be heading straight for disaster, for a crash or a plunge into the abyss. What the angel of history is is impotent to achieve, only the Messiah will be able to accomplish, to still the storm, to bandage the wounded, reawaken the dead, and mend what has been put asunder. In Shalom's view, this formulation contains an implicit reference to the Kabbalistic doctrine of Tikkun, the messianic restitution of the original state of divine harmony broken by the Shevarat Ah HaKelem, the breaking of the vessels, a doctrine Benjamin knew from the article Kabbalah, published by his friend in 1932 in the Encyclopedia Judaica, or Judaica in German. And what is the political counterpart correspondent to this mystical restitution, to this restoration of the lost paradise, to this messianic kingdom? The answer is given in the preparatory notes. A genuinely messianic face must be restored to the concept of classless society. And to be sure, in the interest of furthering the revolutionary politics of the proletariat itself. Because it is only by realizing its messianic significance that one can avoid the pitfalls of progressive ideology. This communist society of the future is, to a certain degree, the return to primitive communism to the first form of classless society at the dawn of history. Shalom is therefore right in saying that, for Benjamin, paradise is at once the origin and primal past of humanity, as well as the utopian image of the future of his redemption. But it seems to me that he is wrong to add that we have here a conception of the historical process that is cyclical rather than dialectical. For Benjamin, the classless society of the future, the new paradise, is not the return pure and simple to the society of prehistory. It contains in itself, as dialectical synthesis, the whole of humanity's past. True universal history, based on the universal remembrance of all victims without exception, the secular equivalent of the resurrection of the dead, will be possible only in the future classless society. The connection made here between the messianic era and the future classless society, like the connection between the other correspondences in the 1940 theses, cannot be understood solely in terms of secularization. There is, in Benjamin, a relation of reciprocal reversibility, of mutual translation between the religious and the political that cannot be unilaterally reduced. In a system of communicating vessels, the fluid is necessarily present in all the arms simultaneously.
Thesis 10. The themes which monastic discipline assigned to friars for meditation were designed to turn them away from the world and its affairs. The thoughts we are developing here have a similar aim. At a moment when the politicians in whom the opponents of fascism had placed their hopes are prostrate and confirm their defeat by betraying their own cause, these observations are intended to extricate the political worldlings from the snares in which the traitors have entangled them. The assumption here is that those politicians' stubborn faith in progress, their confidence in their base in the masses, and finally their servile, in servile integration in an uncontrollable apparatus are three aspects of the same thing. This consideration is meant to suggest the high price our customary mode of thought will have to pay for a conception of history that avoids any, any complicity with the concept of history to which those politicians still adhere. In this thesis, Benjamin resumes his polemic with the dominant conceptions within the left, referring implicitly to the traumatic event that was doubtless the immediate motivation for the drafting of the document, the molotov ribbentrop or Ribbentrop, Ribbentrop Pact. The first sentence is rather paradoxical. Are readers of the theses also to be turned away from the world like monks? Is action to be abandoned in favor of meditation? Such an interpretation would be in total contradiction with the other theses. In our view, another reading seems possible. The me method of these the of the thesis oh, fuck the method of the theses could be said to consist in a stepping back, distancing oneself, and acquiring perspective on current political events not in order to ignore them, but to find their deep causes, and b turning away from the illusions and temptations of the century, the cozy, seductive doctrines of progress. Benjamin seems inspired by ascetic ex exigencies and appears to betray a certain intransigence where worldly compromises are concerned. But the analogy he chooses here is indeed a strange one and is susceptible of much misunderstanding. The expression the politicians in whom the opponents of fascism had placed their hopes is quite clear. He is referring to the Stalinist communists who have betrayed their own cause by making a pact with Hitler. More precisely, the sentence refers to the KPD, German Communist Party, which, unlike the Soviet Communist Party, was prostrate. The hope for a coherent fight against fascism lay, in Benjamin's view, much more with the communist movement than with social democracy. Now the pact had sounded the death knell of that hope. The betrayal here refers not just to the agreement between Molotov and Ribbentrop, but also to its legitimation by the communist parties who were to adopt the Soviet line. It does not in any way for Benjamin mean the break with communism or Marxism, as Soma Morgenstern believes he understood but the definitive and irrevocable dissociation of Soviet re reality from the communist idea. In fact, Benjamin shares his categorical condemnation of the pact with several other dissident German communists exiled in Paris, such as his friend Heinrich Blücher, husband of Hannah Arendt, Willy Munzenberg, and Mainz Sperber. It is the aim of the theses to free Das Paul politisch weltkind from the traps into which he has fallen. This somewhat odd expression, which originates in a poem by Goeth, and which is pluralized here in Harry Zahn's translation as the political worldlings is difficult to translate. Among Benjamin's French translators, Maurice de Gendelac renders it literally as l'enfant politique du monde, while Pierre Missick rather arbitrarily proposes les braves citoyens. However, Benjamin's own French translation gives us the precise sense of his meaning. He renders the expression as les enfants du siècle. This is to say the 20th century generation, his own. Benjamin sets out to free that generation from the snares in which the politicians, his French translation la gauche, is more explicit referring as it does to the great workers' parties, have entangled it. We again meet an image from Nietzsche's untimely observations here, according to which the critical historian, 
the one who dares to swim against the tide, must break with the lies, which all around him spin their glittering nets. In his French translation, Benjamin does not speak of snares or nets, but substitutes the word promesse. The illusory promises of the left have had a paralyzing effect. They neutralize people's efforts and prevent them from acting. These illusions manifest themselves in three forms, which all derive from the same conception of history. Blind faith in progress, the belief in the support of the masses as something insured in advance, and submission to an uncontrollable apparatus. Benjamin translates this as confiance aveugle dans le parti, blind trust in the party. He touches here on a crucial question, bureaucracy, the uncontrollable bureaucratic machine that runs the workers' parties, and the fetishism of the party, which has become an end in itself and is supposed infallible, particularly in the Stalinized communist movement. In one of the preparatory notes, Benjamin writes of trust in quantitative accumulation, which underlies both the obstinate faith in progress and trust in the base and the masses. Benjamin is here criticizing the essential article of faith of unimaginative, reductionist Marxism, common to the two main strands of the left. The quantitative accumul accumulation of productive forces of the gains of the labor movement of the number of party members and voters in a movement of linear, irresistible, automatic progress. <clears throat> when seen that way, historical materialism is reduced to the puppet aut automaton described in Thesis 1. The conclusion to the thesis is a denunciation of the politicians who persist in, who cling to, this tragically illusory view of history. In his in his translation, Benjamin describes them as ceux qui n'ont rien appris, those who have learned nothing, that is to say, those who have resisted drawing any lessons from their terrible defeat at the hands of Nazism. Benjamin refers in this thesis to the left in general and implicitly to the communist parties. In other theses, the target of his criticism is social democracy, to what extent did he know or take his inspiration from dissident currents or dissident currents on the left? We have seen that in the 1930s, he often showed an interest in the writings of Trotsky and Karl Korch was one of his main Marxist references in the Arcades project. Not to mention some of his friends, such as Heinrich Blücher, who were close to the German communist opposition led by Heinrich Brandler. We may note some instances when Benjamin's critiques for example, of the betrayal constituted by the 1939 pact or of the blind submission to the party's bureaucratic apparatus converge with those of these communist dissidents. But the theses call into question the ideology of progress in a much deeper and more thoroughgoing way than, than the critical ideas advanced by most of these dissident Marxist tendencies. From this point of view, the position Benjamin occupies in the field of Marxism in 1939-40 is unique, unprecedented, and unmatched. He is isolated, being too far ahead of his time. It will be several decades before his concerns being to find an echo, or begin to find an echo, in the 1960s among rebellious youth and left-wing intellectuals. The only exception are his friends in the Frankfurt School particularly in the writings in the period 1941 to 48, but they are far from sharing his commitment to the class struggle. If dialectic of enlightenment and also Adorno's minima moralia owe much to Benjamin, the text that comes closest to the theses on the concept of history, even if it does not refer to the same theological and messianic sources, is Horkheimer's authoritarian state pu published in the Institute of Social Research Social Research's 1942 homage to Benjamin. It is, by its explicit political radicalism, a relatively atypical document. According to Horkheimer, since the revolutionary conditions have always been ripe, the imperative of putting an end to the horror was always appropriate. The radical transformation of society, the end of exploitation, are not a further acceleration of progress, but a qualitative leap out of the dimension of progress. 
Thesis 11. The conformism which has marked the social democrats from the, begin from the beginning attaches not only to their political tactics, but to their economic views as well. It is one reason for the eventual breakdown of their party. Nothing has so corrupted the German working class as the notion that it was moving with the current. It regarded technological development as the driving force of the stream with which it thought it was moving. From there, it was but a step to the illusion that the factory work ostensibly furthering technological progress constituted a political achievement. The old Protestant work ethic was resurrected among German workers in secularized form. The Gotha program already bears traces of this confusion, defining labor as the source of all wealth and all culture. Smelling a rat, Marx countered that the man who possesses no other property than his labor power must of necessity become the slave of other men who have made themselves owners. Yet the confusion spread, and soon thereafter Joseph Ditzkin proclaimed, The savior of modern times is called work. The perfecting of the labor process constitutes the wealth which can now do what no redeemer has ever been able to accomplish. This vulgar Marxist conception of the nature of labor scarcely considers the question of how its products could ever benefit the workers when they are beyond the means of those workers. It recognizes only the progress in mastering nature, not the retrogression of society. It already displays the technocratic features that later emerge in fascism. Among these is a conception of nature which differs ominously from the one advocated by socialist utopias prior to the revolution of 1848. The new conception of labor is tantamount to the exploitation of nature, which, with naive complacency, is contrasted with the exploitation of the proletariat. Compared to this pos positivistic view, Fourier's fantasies, which have so often been ridiculed, prove surprisingly sound. According to Fourier, cooperative labor would increase efficiency to such an extent that four moons would illuminate the sky at night, the polar ice caps would recede, seawater would no longer taste salty, and beasts of prey would do man's bidding. All this illustrates a kind of labor which, far from exploiting nature, would help her give birth to the creations that now lie dormant in her womb. The sort of nature that, as Ditskin puts it, exists gratis, is a complement to the corrupted conception of labor. If in Thesis 10 Benjamin is largely taking issue with Stalinist conformism, in Thesis 11 he rounds, he rounds on the conformism of the Social Democrats. In each case, his starting point is the will to understand the deep causes of the defeat of the German labor movement at the hands of Hitlerian fascism. The ideology of work promoted by social democracy was merely a secularized form of the Protestant work ethic, whose close connections by elective affinity to the spirit of capitalism had been laid bare by the researches of Max Weber, which Benjamin knew well. This a-critical celebration of labor as the source of all wealth disregards the fact that, in the capitalist system, the workers reduced to a condition of modern slavery and finds himself divested by the propertied classes of the wealth he produces. Benjamin draws on both Weber and Marx to criticize the conformist posture of social democracy in relation to industrial capitalist production. The cult of work and industry is at the same time a cult of technical progress, a theme with which Benjamin had been intensely concerned since the 1920s. In the essay on Fuchs of 1937, a text that already contains the main themes of Thesis 11, he stresses the contrast between the questionable optimism of social democracy, which ignores the destructive energy of technology, particularly the technology of war, and the vision which flashed on the consciousness of Marx and Engels of the potential evolution of capitalism towards barbarism. Benjamin writes in Thesis 11 of the positivism of the social democratic ideology of progress. The essay on Fuchs had already made reference to the positivism, Darwinism, and evolutionism of European social democracy, and he referred there to the Italian Enrico Ferri, who saw the party's tactics as conforming to the laws of nature, as a typical example. 
A few passages from Ferry's work will illustrate the kind of language Benjamin was taking issue with. According to the Italian social positivist thinker, what scientific socialism can affirm and what it does affirm with mathematical certainty is that the current, the trajectory of human evolution is in a general sense indicated and foreseen by socialism. That is to say, in the sense of a continuous progressive preponderance of the interests and benefits of the species over those of the individual. Socialism is a natural and spontaneous product of human evolution, which is already in the process of formation, general lines of which are already drawn. One does, in fact, find very similar formulations in the writings of Kotsky and Pleknov, and also of Engels, whom Benjamin does not mention. Thesis 11, like the essay on Fuchs, attacks this type of deterministic evolutionist doctrine that leads to the idea that the victory of the party is assured from the outset. Similarly, in a variant, Benjamin quotes a passage from Ditskin. I lost my spot. Oh, we're Wharton on Seer Zit Ab. We are biding our time. The thesis 11 is directed, <clears throat> then again, then, against the illusion of swimming with the tide of technical development, a tide that is supposed to lead necessarily to the triumph of scientific socialism in the positivist sense of the term. This optimistic fatalism could lead the labor movement only to passivity and autontism when the need was, rather, to intervene urgently, to act rapidly before it was too late, before the looming catastrophe arrived. This was one of the reasons for the debacle of 1933. This evolutionary positivist conception of history recognizes only the progress and the domination of nature, not social regression. We find it again later in another form in the technocratic ideology of fascism. Unlike so many other Marxists, Benjamin had clearly perceived the modern, technically advanced aspect of Nazism, combining the greatest technological progress, particularly in the military field, with the most terrible social regressions. What was merely suggested in Thesis 8 is here explicitly affirmed. Fascism, in spite of its archaic cultural manifestations, is a pathological manifestation of industrial capitalist modernity, basing itself on the great technical achievements of the 20th century. Though this does not mean, of course, that modernity for Benjamin cannot take other forms, or that technical progress is necessarily harmful. In his famous, and in many ways remarkable, critical essay on Benjamin, Jürgen Habermas wrote, Historical materialism, which reckons on progressive steps not only in the dimension of productive forces, but in that of domination as well, cannot be covered over with an anti-evolutionary conception of history, as with a monk's cowl. This assertion seems debatable in my view. It raises many questions, such as, for example, 1. Is it certain we can speak of progress in the field of forms of domination, Herrschaft, if we compare the 20th century, the era of totalitarianisms and genocides, with the 19th? 2. Is historical materialism necessarily an evolutionary doctrine? In Marx's own writings, do we not find both evolutionary and non-evolutionary texts, such as his last writings on Russia, for example? And if it is true that the evolutionary and positivist tendencies have predominated in Marxism since the end of the 19th century, do we not also find eminent representatives of a non-evolutionary historical materialism from Antonio Labriola and Rosa Luxemburg to the Frankfurt School itself, to which Habermas claims to be heir? 3. Is the critique of historical evolutionism and its faith in the irresistible progress of forms of domination necessarily an obscurantist regression into the past, a monk's cowl, or is it rather, in the light of the catastrophes of the 20th century, a lucid vision of the dangers contained within modern civilization? 4. 
is what is at stake in the emancipatory struggles for historical materialism and improvement or progress in the forms of domination, or rather the abolition of all hair shaft of one human being over another, of one class over another, what Benjamin describes as the real estate of emergency. Unlike Max Weber, for Benjamin, the concept of hair shaft does not refer to the abstract possibility of making oneself obeyed, but is something more concrete and radical. As it is, for example, in Machiavelli, the authoritarian exercise of power by an, in each case, specific combination of manipulation and violence. And indeed, he often uses the more explicit term, unterdrückung, meaning oppression. In the theses and the preparatory notes known as the paralip paralip fuck, paralipomena, the ruling classes are referred to at times as die Herschenden, the dominant, and at others as die Unterdrucker, the oppressors. The Frankfurt School's critique of domination was no doubt influenced by Benjamin, but Adorno and Horkheimer stressed not so much class power, the combination of domination and exploitation, as statist authoritarianism, total administration. However, all share the Marxian preoccupation with the domination exerted by alienated and personal structures, such as capital or the commodity. The last part of Thesis 11 is extraordinarily topical. It involves a radical critique of the capitalist exploitation of nature and the glorification of that exploitation by vulgar Marxism, which is positivist and technocratic in inspiration. In this field too, Benjamin occupies a unique place in the panorama of Marxist thinking, in the first half of the century, anticipating the ecological preoccupations of the late 20th century, he dreams of a new pact between humans and their environment. Benjamin opposes the progressive ideology of a certain scientific socialism, represented here by the German social positivist Joseph Ditzkin, long forgotten today, but immensely popular in German social democracy at the turn of the century, and often quoted by Lenin in materialism and imperial criticism, his most orthodox work, which reduces nature to an industrial raw material, to a commodity that exists gratis, an object for an unlimited domination and exploitation. Against this approach, Benjamin does not hesitate to appeal to the utopias of the first socialists. Vormarts, before the revolution of March 1848, and in particular, the fantastical dreams of Fourier, to which Andre Breton will pay enthusiastic tribute some 10 years later. Benjamin, who is sensitive to the poetry and enchantment of these dreams, interprets them as the intuiting of a different, non-destructive relation to nature, leading both to new scientific discoveries. Electricity might be an example of the virtual energy that now lies dormant in nature's bosom, and to the re-establishment of the lost harmony between society and the natural environment. Benjamin's interest in and admiration for Fourier grew steadily throughout the 1930s. The Arcade's project casts light on the points made in Thesis 11. Benjamin does not counterpoise Fourier to Marx. He carefully records all the instances when Marx or Engels praise the colossal conception of man, of the inventor of the phalansteries and his brilliant intuitions of a new world, but to the vulgar Marxism shared by the main currents of the left. Linking the abolition of the exploitation of human labor closely with that of the exploitation of nature, Benjamin saw the impassioned work of the Harmonians, inspired by children's play, as the utopian model for emancipated activity. To have instituted play as the canon of a labor no longer rooted in exploitation, he wrote, is one of the great merits of Fourier. Such work inspired by play aims not at the pro propagation of values, but as the amelioration of nature, an earth that was cultivated according to such an image would cease to be part of a world where action is never the sister of the dream. In the Arcade's project, the name of Fourier is associated with that of Bakafin, who had discovered the ancestral image of this reconciliation in matriarchal society in the form of the cult of nature as bountiful mother, in radical opposition to the lethal conception of the exploitation of nature 
dominant since the 19th century. In the ideal harmony between society and nature the utopian socialist dreamt of, Benjamin perceives reminiscence or reminiscences of a lost prehistoric paradise. This is why in the essay, Paris, the capital of the 19th century, he refers to Fourier as an example of the meeting of the old and the new in, ut in a utopia that breathes new life into the primeval symbols of desire.